Hello everyone, welcome back to Zeros TV. I'm joined today by Edwin Dorsey, the author of the Bear Cave newsletter. This is a flash update we're doing to update you on what happens in between the reports that come out on Zeros TV. Edwin, thank you so much for coming back. Max, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. All right, well, short selling is, is often driven by these reports that are released, but so much happens in between the new ideas that come out on Zeros TV. So we wanted to turn to you because you do such a great job at the Bear Cave of keeping up with all of the short seller research that goes out and as well just the market in general from the perspective of a short seller or somebody who's really interested in short selling. So Edwin, let's start there. What has happened in the last few weeks? Well, there were six new activist short reports last week. It's been a busy time in the activist short world. Uh, there was a new uh, anonymous activist short, Swan Street Research, that launched, um, that published on Yala Group. Uh, th those are some of the big things that have been happening in the activist short world. So you mentioned six new activist short reports. Are they all new activists themselves? How many of them were just new reports from existing um, short sellers that, that people are probably already familiar with? A lot of been existing ones. The one that got a lot of attention and flack maybe on Twitter was Spruce Point published a second update on Danimer Scientific, this like ESG SPAC. Uh, and in it, he misquoted David Einhorn and that got a lot of attention on Twitter. Um, but most of it is just the people you know. Hindenburg published a one on an OTC company, uh, stuff like that. Okay, so what was the misquoting that happened with Einhorn? I think I saw that in your newsletter. It looks like they just took the nice things that Einhorn said and left out his criticism of their report. What Spruce Point said uh, on, like, I think the third slide of their Danimer presentation was they said, they quoted Einhorn saying, most recently, Danimer has been target a target of a pair of aggressive short seller reports from a single entity. We have followed this author's work for a long time. He's extremely smart and capable. And that's where Spruce Point ended the Einhorn quote right there. He's extremely smart and capable. In reality, Einhorn continued on and said, however, the reports on Danimer are so full of blatant misuse of data that we have to believe that the purpose is so intentionally wrong to spread false and misleading information for the purpose of affecting the short-term stock price. We, of course, support the vigorous debate and discussions about stocks, but there are limits, and these reports, in our view, cross the line and represent the worst elements of the short-selling profession. So David Einhorn gave a very critical view on Ben Axler of Spruce Point's work on Danimer, but somehow Spruce Point just took out the positive two sentences and left the negative stuff in there. That, that was really questionable to me. They also published their second update on the Friday of options expirations, which I think made people roll their eyes a bit because that's the one thing that activist shorts get a lot of you know fair criticism for is it might be too short term oriented just trying to move the stock for a day and when you're misquoting somebody and publishing right into options expiration uh, I, I think that's getting well deserved scrutiny well it's very interesting that you bring that up because oftentimes this sort of short and distort is the common narrative against the short sellers i mean you talk to so many people in the short selling world i mean can what ha how do the other short sellers feel when this sort of stuff comes out? I mean, it just creates a bad name for the strategy in general. Yeah, I, I think there's like a, a few different views on it. So some activist short people trade their own money or, or, or hold positions for a period of times. Other times you're partnering with another fund who's trading it for you and you're splitting a percentage of the profits. I think that is starting to get more scrutiny, especially if you're hyping up a big report and covering the day after. Uh, on the other hand, people would say this is the model and if you do exaggerate stuff, you might make money once, but you're gonna ruin your reputation. So this type of trading is okay. It just naturally your reputation is gonna be gone if you do questionable things. I'm not sure what the right answer is, but there's definitely getting these two divergent views of trade your own money, write a report, but hold a position for at least a week, while other people are more make a big report, make a bang, cover in two days, and that's the compensation you get for bringing new information to the market. Those are kind of the two dominant views right now. Well, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, Swan Street and the report on Yala Group. I know you said there was another short seller who wrote that up, and then as well, you wrote it up independently. So three different groups of people all targeted Yala Group in the same week without really 
happened. I mean, I know you didn't coordinate with the other two, but uh, it's very interesting. So let's let's talk about that individual name, what you wrote up, and then as well just the emergence of a of a new um, researcher in this world. Uh, so Max Yala Group, it's a roughly two billion dollar company. They're a Middle Eastern social uh, media platform. They're kind of like the clubhouse of the Middle East. They have like audio rooms you can join and participate in. And they earn money when users buy virtual gifts to give to other people on the app. Uh, people were tweeting about it a lot critically over the last two weeks. That's what got my attention. And I assume that's what got other people's attention. Uh, this a Twitter handle named Occam's Razor uh, on Monday of last week pointed out that a lot of these rooms are like suspicious, empty, it looks like there's a lot of bot activity, just it doesn't make sense. And that's the kind of the extent of the Occam's Razor report, which is just this anonymous Twitter guy put it out to his roughly 7,000 followers. Then on Wednesday of last week, Swan Street Research put out a bigger report uh, that said they thought revenue was being overstated and that the cash balance for Yala might not be real. Uh, Yala has their cash in like all different jurisdictions, including, including Singapore, where they have like no operations. Uh, another thing highlighted in the report is that even though they say they're a Middle Eastern company, the vast majority of their employees are in China, their investors are in China, their management teams in China. So it's more like a Chinese company pretending to be a Middle Eastern company than an actual company like based in Dubai, its home market. Um, and then what I did is I, I don't take a position myself. I, I write premium reports for paid subscribers to the Bear Cave newsletter. And I, I kind of highlighted that I went on the app. You, there's an English version of the app as well as an Arabic version. And just a lot of the rooms were empty or playing music. And it's not like the type of environment. Like, it just didn't make sense. There's just so I, I would t t message users on the app. Is this a real app? Why is no one talking and just not get a response? So there's definitely something odd, in my opinion, going on with Yala Group, ticker YALA. The company announced a big buyback, which made the share spike a little, but since then it's been down and it, it looks like it's pretty heavily shorted now. I think the borrows increased, but this is one that just like leaves your head scratching. So what is the market cap again? You said it's 2 billion? I think it's 2 billion now. It might've been like, you know, 4 billion before people started digging into it. But you know, if, if you really actually are overstating users by 80% or something, you know, maybe it's not worth 2 billion at all. So you went onto the English version of the app and there were these empty rooms with music playing. Was it like the virtual feeling of being in a sort of rundown old mall? Yeah, it was just not what I expected. And, you know, it's kind of interesting when you read about a company, you, you get a certain feel listening to management going on their website, but actually using the product, you can't ever replace that feeling for yourself. And I just hop in these rooms and some would just be empty. They would have a lot of people in it, but there would just be no talking or other times, especially in the Arabic version one, it would just be music playing and there would be supposedly lots of people in the room, but there'd be no talking. And it just didn't, it didn't really make sense to me. The, uh, the app has a counter to show how many gifts, like paid gifts have been given in a day and who's purchasing the mo most tokens. Uh, somebody was taking screenshots of the app, I believe it was the Occam's Razor report and showed like there would be these huge like, $20 million jumps in amounts of gifts purchased like in a 15 minute period, which didn't make a lot of sense if you were expecting like organic human activity. Um, to go back to your earlier question, I think their stated revenue for the last quarter was about 60 million US dollars. Uh, so there's just a lot of things when it comes to Yala that don't make a ton of sense. One thing I, I, I did spend a lot of time on is the PCAOB has a database where you can put in any company. It'll show you the auditor. It'll also show you the specific audit partner responsible for that audit. The specific audit partner responsible for Yala most recently has been responsible for a company that got delisted as well as two other companies that like fell 90% or more, which maybe, uh, you know, raises problems there. Uh, so a lot doesn't make sense when it comes to Yala. I want to broaden this discussion a little bit. So we've been focused really on what's happening in the short seller world, but I want to get your perspective on what's happening outside of the short seller world and the market environment, because that can 
have an effect on one, whether people are publishing reports and, and two, the effectiveness of those reports. So from your perspective, you know, in the last few weeks, how has the environment been for short sellers? I'd imagine it's been positive. I'm, I'm a little less strong when it comes to like general market uh, conditions, but uh, I, I think generally short activist shorts do best when they can get attention. So if there's a lot of big news or splashy events or earnings calls going on, that is probably a more difficult period to be an activist short seller because it's tough to get people's attention. But after Q1 earnings are done, assuming there's no dominant story in the media, when people have free time to read things, that's I think when activist shorts probably do the best. Um, so, so now is probably a decent time for them. Well, Edwin, thank you so much for coming back on Zeros and updating us all on what's happening in the market. Max, absolutely, and I'm happy to do this anytime. Thanks for having me on.